Well, good morning, everyone. So good to have you here. Those of you worshiping with us in person, those of you worshiping online, especially to all your fathers, thank you so much for uh, dedicating a part of your day to worshiping with us. You know, I was thinking this week, and I was reminded, uh, back in the day, I used to teach world religions, and I came across a story I used to tell about uh, a, an ancient Chinese merchant, and he was selling a spear and a shield. And when he was asked about his spear, he said, this, peer, this spear is so powerful, it will penetrate any shield. And he was asked about the shield. He said, this shield is so strong, it can resist any spear. And then they ask, well, what happens if your spear meets your shield? And he had no answer. <laughs> it's that age-old paradox. What happens if an irresistible force meets an unmovable object? But sometimes, this is more than a philosophical discussion. Sometimes it's life, real life. We hit those irresistible forces. At least they seem irresistible to us or those unmovable objects. Sometimes we feel a little like this guy in the picture we're going to show you. <laughs> You're pushing, but that rock, it ain't going anywhere. You're putting all your energy, but it's just way too big. You know, here at Roser, we've been working on the essential discipline of prayer. And today I want us to see that prayer, it's given to us for times like these. When we hit those forces that seem irresistible, those obstacles that cannot be moved. In this particular case, it's the disciples that seem to hit that obstacle. They run into something that they can't fix, they can't heal, they can't straighten out. Now, in fairness to them, they were just doing what Jesus said to do. Earlier in the story, Jesus sent them on a mission. He said to them clearly, go heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those that have leprosy, cast out demons, freely you have received, now freely give. Now, let's just review that mission. <laughs> that sounds hard, doesn't it? It sounds difficult, especially that whole raise the dead part. That's pretty impossible. So in fairness to the disciples, they were just doing the impossible thing that Jesus asked them to do. And yet, while they did it, they hit this obstacle that didn't seem to move. A force that was controlling this sun that could not be stopped. We're told about it in Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son. He had said he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. You could hear the cry of the father's heart. Something was going on with his son, and he couldn't fix it. He had no answers. And so he had heard of Jesus in the area. Jesus, this Jesus that works miracles, and he brought the son to Jesus. Jesus wasn't there. He had gone up in a mountain with Peter, James, and John. There were nine disciples there. And they were trying to do what Jesus would have done. They were trying to heal this young man while this father just grieved about this force that was driving his child. You know, it's perhaps easy to be tough on the disciples. Why couldn't they do that? Oh, but I think we need to step back and understand the context here. They were seeking to do the will of God. They were working to do the impossible. You know, sometimes when we meet an obstacle in our life and we're praying for it to go away, we're thinking about what we want and what we need. If that's our world. It's about my life. But I wonder if 
this context makes sense to us or it bears upon our life situation, I wonder if we think of ourselves as the ones who are called to do the impossible thing God has called us to do. What if we just didn't focus upon our needs and our obstacles, but we were obsessed with doing the will of God, not just our will, but God's will? What if the power of prayer, effective prayer, worked especially strongly when we're doing what God calls us to do? And we meet these irresistible objects in the context of serving God. See, this happens, it's an example in the scriptures where Jesus uses this situation to drive home a point. That yes, he's called us to do this impossible job. But that's precisely when he shows up. That's precisely when he appears. There they are, the disciples, they met this unmovable object in the course of doing God's will, and Jesus shows up. Look at verse 17. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. And Jesus rebuked the deepen, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Shocking words, perhaps. I mean, here were these disciples just trying to do what God called them to do, and Jesus says, you unbelieving and perverse generation. Seems a little strong, doesn't it? What's his point there? What's he, what's he doing? That word perverse, it, it talks about being twisted. It means you're off the path. I believe that what we're seeing here is a frustrated Jesus. He's watching this father and suffering son, and he's given this gift to these 12 to go out and, and cure the problem, and, and it's not happening. Now, he's been with the disciples for a period of time now. He's been among the people for a period of time. They've watched him do one miracle after another. They've watched him heal the sick and cast out demons and cleanse the leper. They've even seen him raise the dead. And yet here they are. They've been given this gift. God gives them this power, and yet something's missing. There's a gap there. And I think what we hear in Jesus' heart is the anguish about this suffering father and this son. He came to fix that problem. And he saw things that the disciples were not seeing. They were, they were working. They were doing their best. They were trying to follow through all the motions. They were saying their prayers. They were doing it all correctly, but the obstacle wasn't moving. There was a gap there. And Jesus is saying, did you not see who walks among you? <laughs> the Spirit of God? I think the problem is they're seeking to do that on their own as if they can fix the problem when they don't understand that there's a Christ there who does all this stuff. He has been doing it. He can do it. He will do it. You know, in some ways, those early disciples, they had an advantage over us. I mean, they were there. I mean, imagine you were there. You saw Jesus do that. You saw Jesus heal. You would think if you saw it with your own eyes, that would change your life. But it turns out that miracles are overrated sometimes. Because these people who saw these things, they just needed another miracle. They needed to see it one more time. They still weren't convinced. It still hadn't made sense in their soul that this Jesus who does all this is walking among them. He's right there. And they were out there doing things the way they always did. They're trying to fix the problem, trying to fulfill the mission, but doing it out of their own soul, with their own knowledge, their own wisdom. But here was this Jesus who comes and he looks at the situation and he sees that the problem is spiritual. Uh, underneath the physical symptoms, there was a spiritual problem. 
Now, we don't see this much in the West, this phenomenon of spirits kind of controlling people this way. Um, I will tell you that this phenomenon is seen more often in other cultures where indigenous religions are strong and they believe strongly in the power of spirits to influence people. You see this phenomenon more. But for whatever reason, Jesus sees it that day and he cures the problem by casting out the spirit. But see, this is another level where we depend upon Jesus. The disciples, they're seeing the physical symptom, but Jesus is looking behind all that and he's seeing the spiritual cause to all this. Those of you who are fathers and you've wept over your children, you're seeing the symptoms and you ask the question, why? What's the cause? What's underneath? And Jesus is teaching us here that he knows the cause. He sees the heart. He sees the soul. He grieves with us. He grieves with fathers. He grieves with mothers. He's there. He wants someone to reach out and be a part of the solution. He wants to go to the soul, spiritual cause of the symptoms and heal at that root level. That's why he came in to this world. He wants the disciples to see all that. I said they had an advantage because they saw it with their own eyes, but see, they were still figuring it out. They were still putting the pieces together. We have an advantage over them on another level. We see the whole story of Jesus. We know the whole mission of Jesus. We see the crucifixion where death is not the end, where life eternal resides in him. We see how Jesus fulfilled all the scriptures. We have the whole picture. And I wonder as we look at the whole picture, if Jesus wouldn't be saying a similar challenge to us. See, we're on the same mission. There are suffering people all around us. Now, maybe we haven't been given the gift of raising the dead. <laughs> I haven't. Maybe we haven't been given the gift of casting out demons. Maybe that isn't what we have been freely given. But we have been given the presence of God's spirit in our soul, the truth and the love and the power to get out there in the broken world and be part of the solution. And I wonder if one of the reasons why we're not as effective as we should be It's because we are still trying to do it by ourselves, still trying to think and focus on the symptoms and not going to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the source of all that, who is the power behind all that. There ought to be a realization that it's God working in us. We're not going to solve the problem by ourselves. Only Jesus can get to the root. And then he makes this even clearer to the disciples. Look at verse 19. He says, Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. And the Gospel of Mark adds a little bit more to his story. He adds that this, Jesus said, this kind can come out only by prayer. And if you have an old King James, it even goes beyond that. It adds the translation that says, by prayer and fasting. But regardless of the prayer and the fasting piece, the major point here is faith. Whether it's faith in the prayer, faith in the fasting, it's, it's, it's faith. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, you have so little of it. By saying you just need the faith of a mustard seed, a mustard seed is microscopic. It's very, very tiny if you've ever seen one. In my age, I need glasses to see one. All right? So what Jesus is really telling the disciples, you have no faith. You don't even have this much faith. After seeing all those examples, you're still trying to do it by yourself on your own with your own power. Do you understand that the way that the impossible barriers break down is if you bring me into the equation. If it's through his spirit and his power and his insight, Jesus is the one who's changing through us and in us. See, the secret to 
moving obstacles is in the Lord who leads us. We are totally dependent upon him in our ministry. We are totally dependent upon him to give us strength. We need to be explicitly and constantly reminding ourselves in dialogue with Christ all the time through prayer, yes, through fasting, through all possibilities, that Jesus, you must be the power in me because I cannot face these obstacles by myself. They seem immovable. These forces cannot be stopped. The only way healing is going to come in this situation, if you bring your wisdom and your power and your strength. You know, yesterday we remembered for the first time a federal holiday, Juneteenth. This celebration of, of a victory, really, in human history. When at last, the uh, last slaves in Texas were freed by proclamation some 155 years or 56 years ago. And as part of my own reflection upon that event and thinking about what that means for us today, I ran across a, an article uh, by the late Karina Scott King. Um, she was, of course, the widow or the, the late widow of the Dr. Martin Luther King. And she wrote an article at one point about the power of prayer in the whole um, civil rights movement. And it was about how prayer changes things. And in the context of the article, she was talking about how prayer worked in the life of Dr. King. And she remembered a time when it was just at the end of, uh, just as they were going through the, the uh, Montgomery bus boycott, and there was all kinds of hostility, all kinds of tension, all kinds of stress, a very divisive time. And he came home one night extremely exhausted from the day's activities in that protest. And then late at night, he got a phone call that was threatening, abusive, which she says he got all the time. But for some reason, this particular time, it just put him over the edge. And so he just put on a pot of coffee and he started to pray. And let me just read how she tells that story. With his head in his hands, Martin bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud to God. Lord, I am taking a stand for what I believe is right. The people are looking for me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they will falter. I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I have nothing left. I have come to the point where I can't face it alone. Later he told me at that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never experienced him before. It seemed as though I could hear a voice saying, stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, and God will be at our side forever. When Martin stood up from that table, he was imbued with a new sense of confidence, and he was ready to face anything. Even as talented and as gifted a leader as Dr. King was, he reached the place where the obstacle was too big. That obstacle of racism, it was too big for him to move, even with his gifts and the talents. He had to get to the place where he realized he had nothing. And then God have, gave him power to keep fighting and keep praying and keep working. It's a lesson we all need to learn. It's the point, I think, of this story. It's simply this, that when we encounter those obstacles, they're less intimidating when we dialogue with the Lord who controls all of it. We don't have all the answers. We don't know all the causes. We don't know all that, but we know the Lord who does. And that Lord has called us to go into this impossible world of brokenness to deal with the immovable objects and the irresistible forces. And through his power and through his spirit in ways we will not understand and don't understand. And yes, it may require us to suffer. Yes, it may require us to sacrifice. Yes, it will require time. But it will take many of us continuing to wage the war in prayer. 
Let's not be intimidated by the level of hurt and pain and animosity and division in this country. Let us not be intimidated at all. Because we serve a Lord, we serve a master who has called us to go into that impossible place and he will go with us to break down the forces and move the objects. We just need to stay connected to him and understand it's through him and his power. Can we redouble our efforts in prayer? Recognize again that we have nothing unless Jesus is there in the midst doing the work, the miracles that we require. So where do we go from here? How do we start that process? I realize there are many prayer warriors here at Roser that have been doing this for decades now, and they could give you examples of how they've just gone to God time after time and watch God move mountains in their lives. But many of us, we're getting started. So I've challenged us to pray for one. Pray for that one obstacle, that, that one force, that one person, that one issue, whatever it is, let's pray for that. And let's remember, based upon this story, that we're not there alone facing this obstacle, that the Spirit of God is there. Jesus Christ himself has gone before us He's the one facing the obstacle. He, he's the one carrying the load. We just need to go to him and stay connected to him. And then share that journey. Share it with somebody else. And we'll go on that journey together. Whatever the cost, whatever the hardship, whatever the seeming defaults, whatever the seeming failures, we're going to continue to press through because God has already determined the outcome. It is victory. Let's just start with that pray for one and share the journey. And Continue to reflect on Jesus. We continue our classes exploring the gospel, Mark. We still have a couple weeks left of that. You're welcome to participate. We do it at 10 o'clock at my house, at 2 o'clock here at the church, and we do it online at night through Zoom at 7 o'clock. If you want to participate in any of those, just go on the church website, rosachurch.com. There's a place there to sign up. The whole point of that is to continue to reflect on this Jesus who moves mountains. And if any of you want to follow up in a conversation, talk about some of this stuff we've just kind of raised up. I put my email address out there, Dirk at RoserChurch.com. Just send me an email and we'll have a conversation. I don't have all the answers, but I know the one who does. And we'll go to him together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this challenge from your word. It's, it's stern words for us to realize how addicted we are to doing things on our own and thinking we can solve the world's problems and getting frustrated and discouraged by the size of the obstacles before us. And so, Father, we just come before you and pour out our hearts and let you know we have nothing unless you fill us with your power and your strength. But through you, there's nothing we cannot do because there's nothing you cannot do. Help us to be a part of this solution in this broken world, to be a part of healing those who are hurting. We give this impossible mission to you knowing that you can do it and will do it as you have promised. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.